there's sort of this story of, you know, we're moving away from oil and oil demand is peaking. If you just Google oil demand peaking or oil peaking, peak oil, whatever, you see tons of stuff on it. It's not oil supply peaking. It's oil demand. There's just the narrative is overwhelming. Oil prices continue to drop and many people think it's because the world just doesn't need as much oil. But global oil consumption is actually rising. Josh Young, portfolio manager and co-founder of Bison Interests, joins us today to talk about what's next for the oil and gas industry. And his answers really might surprise you. I'm Ed D'Agostino, and this is Global Macro Update. So Josh, you get two big stories dominating oil right now, at least from, from my perspective. You've got weak demand coming out of China and you've got a global supply glut. That's the, that seems to be the two narratives that are weighing oil prices down. Do, do you agree with those two things? Certainly there's higher production than I would have thought. And I think than the consensus expected a year ago and China's consumption grew less this year than consensus expectations and then they said they would and then um you know even sort of the the low end growth expectations from the IEA and EIA so so yes so uh that's a those are that's a good summary those are sort of the two factors um why don't we talk about the supply issue first because i think there's a lot of sort of misconceptions around oil supply um so so it is important to distinguish oil and natural gas liquids, because that's sort of how people count global oil supply. It's not like there's actually 104 million barrels a day of crude oil that's produced. That's crude oil, that's condensate, that's various other natural gas liquids that are produced. And so that clarification is really important because people look at shale and they say, well, shale oil production is not up. Over the last, let's say, let's say year to date, it's actually down a little bit and year over year it's up very slightly and way less than people expect. Natural gas liquids production is up quite a bit year to date. Um, so, so it's important to distinguish that. But then when you dig in one more level, and this is the thing everyone's eyes glaze over, but it's, I think, probably the single sort of thing that people get wrong from a narrative versus reality for the market. Um, there, there was a phenomenon called ethane. There's a phenomenon called ethane rejection. Basically, you can shift liquids either to be used for chemicals and various other sort of oil-like feedstocks, or you can shift it back into the natural gas supply. And because of very low natural gas prices in the U.S., and because there was a big build out of chemical processing to be able to separate out ethane and then process it. Um, we're up in terms of ethane production by over 300,000 barrels a day this year. And that actually represents the majority, it looks like, um, of liquids production growth in the U.S. so far this year. So there's a story about a glut, but then there's a reality when you go one level down that ethane is actually getting, there is more ethane getting pulled out of the gas supply to get used for chemicals. It competes with oil but there's a whole other dynamic and there's very little growth beyond what we've already experienced that's basically flatlining because you need more processing plants to get built to get any more ethane pulled out. So again, it's one of those sort of nuances. When you start talking about ethane rejection, everyone leaves the room or turns off their, you know, <laughs> it's like guaranteed to clear a room. Um, but I think it's really important. And from a global perspective, that incremental roughly 300,000 barrels a day is enough to move the needle, have people very worried about a shale glut, but also I think is very calming once you understand what's actually happening, why it grew and why it's not growing more right now. How much would you say oil remains a global uh, commodity? Because, you know, I mean, if the U.S. now, if I understand correctly, is producing more oil or more petroleum than any country in the history of the planet. Like we, we, we are the dominant producer and exporter right now. But I hear the story about global glut of, of oil and I look around at the geopolitics and I scratch my head a little bit, to be honest. Right. You've got Venezuela used to be a huge oil producer, no longer is and is politically a, a dumpster fire. Um, 
you, you've got uh, Colombia was ramping up their oil production. Now you have rebels attacking their, their, their pipelines, spilling oil into their rivers. The Red Sea is not exactly friendly to shipping oil right now, as you well know. Um, how secure is the global supply? The really interesting thing, when you look at sort of what surprise to the upside so far this year in terms of oil supplies, right? Because again, the question is, hey, how do we get to this point where oil prices right now are crashing and sort of what happens next, I think is really what everyone would be thinking about. So when you when you look at it, um, there, there's a story around OPEC spare capacity and I think concern that OPEC isn't um, producing as much as it could. And there's, there's people are worried about this OPEC meeting that's coming up soon. Um, but a lot of the, the surprises to the upside are from countries like Iran and Venezuela, like you mentioned. And when you look across these different regions, and then there's been some cheating on OPEC quotas by Iraq and, um, a little bit by some of the, let's just call them uh, I don't want to pick on any individual one, but the former Soviet republics, um, there's been some some cheating there too. Um, and so um, when you look at it, there's actually a lot less spare capacity than people think. And if there were to be a shortage for some reason, let's say China grows more or various other stuff, and we'll get into demand in a second, there's actually way less spare capacity. And the the geopolitical levers that could get pulled by the Biden Harris administration, as well as by other uh, sort of leaders worldwide, have been pulled to allow oil production back online by these groups that sponsor terror or violate elections rules or various other things. And so there's way less spare capacity than I think people think. And part of it is just that the narrative is all about the measured spare capacity from OPEC members that I guess. Uh, count or are, are sort of non-exempt. But when you include the ones that are exempt, you know, oil doesn't really know where it's from. It doesn't really matter. The oil that like gets processed, your gasoline doesn't know if it came from Iran originally or Venezuela or California or Texas. It doesn't, it doesn't know where it's from. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think there's sort of this very interesting dynamic there since you mentioned the disruptions in Colombia and disappointments in various other countries. I think when you look at a lot of the incremental supply, part of it's U.S. and again, part of that's NGLs and various other factors that are, are I think, a little more ephemeral than people are thinking. Um, and then a lot of it's also from these other places that have limits. I'm not sure how much more Iran can actually grow. Can they really go over 4 million barrels a day sustainably? I, I mean, I think that's a, it's a real question and they haven't really produced much more than they're producing now sustainably for over a decade and, and maybe uh, maybe more. Uh, I think there might have been a brief time where they got over 5 million barrels a day, you know, let's say over five years ago. But again, do they really have that production capacity? Have they, have they juiced it? Have they gunned everything they can from their existing fields? And then Venezuela certainly can produce more, but how much more investment is necessary and how much how much like more is going to come versus how likely is it that that production gets turned off? Similar question on Iran. And so when you look at these sort of incremental sources, um, I think a lot of the places that we've been getting more oil from than people thought um, are, I think, at risk or at the very least are sort of tapping out. And then the one other point there is uh, Guyana, where there's a little less oil there than people think. There's enormous fields. Yeah. Uh, there was this news that came out the other day, and it really upset a bunch of people, but it's worth citing. And I'm not 100% sure it's true, but it sort of makes sense. Um, the the Liza fields were supposed to be Liza 1, Liza 2. They were supposed to produce a certain amount over a 20-year period. And Exxon chose to accelerate that. And the claim was that these have already been producing now for a little while. And at the current pace and the current trajectory, those fields would produce for seven years rather than 20. Because if you look at the booked reserves, that's sort of what was booked. And it's sort of simplistic and maybe it'll produce more and maybe not. But it was a very interesting claim and it wasn't refuted yet by the operators. And so it might actually be that this place that people think is sort of the next Saudi Arabia or next whatever, you know, you've heard various sort of claims on that. It might actually be a lot harder to grow and it may grow a lot less than I think people are thinking. 
from a narrative perspective, let's say over the next five years. I think there's going to be a lot more investment required and Guyana might get to maybe 2 million barrels a day, but it's going to be real hard for it to grow a lot more than that. And then it might require a lot of reinvestment in order to sustain that over a million barrel a day uh, production level. Do you think Exxon did that because they had concerns about geopolitical risk? It's a it's a rough neighborhood with an angry neighbor in Venezuela. Were they basically just trying to amortize their investment over over more more gallons or more barrels per year? Maybe, or maybe they were just trying to get as much oil out as quickly as they could while oil prices were high. Or maybe they were concerned with the local dynamic where there is this concept of a resource curse where countries that have large resource discoveries often end up much worse off because of those discoveries, especially the people in those countries. And so you have this tendency for devolution of a local economy over time um, when, when you have these sort of big natural resource discoveries and projects. And then you also have a tendency towards expropriation, where once production is sort of fully on, there's a tendency for the national oil companies or for various local politicians to either formally or informally uh, attempt to uh, reallocate the economics <laughs> from these projects. And so far, Guyana has been wonderful for the most part, it, although it does seem like there have been some shifts very recently. And when you look at this fight that Exxon is having with Chevron, there are shades of that where there's, it should be a sort of normal contract dispute. And there's shades of some of this stuff you would see in other parts of South America and offshore Africa and various other spots where there's been, there have been real issues. And since you mentioned it, Venezuela's right next door and Venezuela went sort of one step further and, you know, nationalized uh, their oil and then expropriated even after they formed, uh, was at Pedavesa, um, they they actually went and did one more step and sort of stole everyone else's resources even after even after that nationalization. So so there's a history in that immediate region. So I think again, it's not that Guyana will do that. It's that Exxon's done this for over a hundred years, and they sort of know if you can get more oil sooner uh, and sell it, especially at a high price, you should. And even if you have to pay a little more in order to build more production capacity and you overbuild a little, hey, versus the giant amount of incremental revenue and cash flow, it makes sense. So good for them. I'm not knocking it at all. You know, they're, they're, they're the best at this. Um, the, between Exxon and Chevron, they're, they're the best globally at this. It's, it's more, what does that tell you about the world oil supply? And, you know, there's a lot of, detailed engineering work, which I think is is right, but there's also these narratives of, oh, here, here's this glut, here's this big discovery and the next one, and we have tons of oil. And the reality is that there have been very few, very large discoveries. Guyana was discovered uh, essentially for modern purposes in 2015. And so uh, that, that it became clear there was going to be a lot of oil. And here we are, almost 10 years later and barely starting to get oil out of the ground. So I think there's going to be a lot of supply challenges and it's fun to pick on that one just because I think it's, you know, front and center. It's getting headlines because of this dispute between Exxon and Chevron. And it is the big incremental global source of supply when you look beyond U.S. oil shale. You said something earlier about that there were some political levers pulled um, to allow for the flow of oil from Iran and Venezuela. Do you think that was because there's an election coming? Not to get too conspiracy theory on you, but um, it does make it does make you wonder. Yeah, I mean, there's there's incentives and people behave according to their incentives. And so if your conspiracy involves people behaving according to their incentives and sort of a very basic Milton Friedman price theory, incentive theory sort of thing, you're just stating classic economics with a, a Milton Friedman bent and he won the Nobel Prize in economics for it. And most of our sort of uh, public policy and most of our understanding of the world is either in that or in opposition to that framework of understanding human behavior. So I don't think I don't think that should classify as a conspiracy theory. I think it makes sense that that would happen as unfortunate but it's a reality. And yeah, that probably has a, is probably a factor, but there's other factors too. You know, there's a, a unfortunate war, Russia invaded Ukraine. And so there was a lot of real risk and real supply disruption, risk and uncertainty. And so, you know, there's other reasons as well, but certainly if there is a major incentive for people to behave a certain way, believing that they may be acting in line with that incentive seems to me to be very rational and reasonable and not at all 
in the category of a conspiracy theory. Okay. Cheap gas helps you get reelected. That's the bottom line. What about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve or the lack thereof in this country? I've heard arguments that it maybe isn't as critical as it used to be domestically, and I I guess I could buy some of that, but we have allies. Jan Stewart made this point to me last year. You know, we, maybe we don't need it right now, but our allies certainly could could use it and uh, and could use some help. And our capacity is massive, and we've released a lot of it for for a variety of reasons. Some good, perhaps some not so good. But uh, wh- where is it now, and what do you see happening to the SBR moving forward? So it's been substantially depleted. Um, it's been. A little refilled this year, but it was substantially depleted. Um, at the very start, when Russia did invade Ukraine, it made sense to release some oil from the SPR to mitigate any risk of a true sort of supply disruption and energy shock. That that made sense at the very beginning. But then when it was um, escalated substantially and ramped into that November 2022 election, that seemed to me to be really inappropriate sort of election interference. And you know that that was really, I thought, offsides. Um, I think that SPRs make a lot of sense. One, for the reason you described, even if we're producing enough oil for our own consumption, um, there aren't similar SPRs in Europe and various other places where we have allies. And there is a real strategic value, even if we aren't the ones that need it. Like if you have something that's really valuable and could get disrupted, why would you voluntarily, if it costs very little to hold it, the, the overhead on it is de minimis, why would you voluntarily get rid of that? And then certainly it's not because of concerns around deficit spending, where what are we at, like a 7% or something deficit? Uh, I mean, it's sort of wild. So so clearly we don't care that much about that. So if we're going to waste all this money, we should at least, if there's something that's clearly strategic, Again, even if it's not necessarily just for us, if it's strategic to our position in the world and maybe economically strategic, where if our allies' economies don't collapse in an oil price spike, maybe that also helps our economy. And there's a very, very high ROI on on that, even if we're not the ones that actually get to use that oil from the SPR. Um, So I think think when you look at the balances, it makes a lot of sense to to have a large SPR. It's not a one-sided thing. Like uh, the Republicans were selling oil from the SPR before, and then Democrats and the Republicans, and now uh, Democrats sold a lot and then have been replenishing a little. So it's not it's not a one-party thing. But yeah, it seems like a mistake to get rid of it. And um, you know, the world keeps using more and more oil every year, despite the transition narrative, despite the you know alternatives narrative. Um, so you know, if we're using more and more of it then why not keep some in storage? And actually, I'll share, this is actually against my own personal economic interest. So oil production and oil producers would be much more highly valued if there were to be a sort of true energy shock where there wasn't enough oil for, let's say, the UK or Germany or something like that. So It's actually in my economic interest for there to be a fully depleted SPR. So that way prices go up a lot more and there's more of a revaluation. So again, it's it's possible for people to be altruistic and to understand their incentives and weave them for specific reasons. And so in this case, I think the I think oil prices will eventually go up enough anyway. And these producers are so cheap, they generate lots of cash flow, they pay lots of you know dividends and buybacks and do accretive acquisitions. There's there's great things happening with them economically. I don't think I need that sort of catastrophe in order to become even more even more rich. Like I'm I'm fine. Right. Um and, but but I would be. So it's actually people say, Oh, you want this because it would be in your economic self-interest. And actually my economic self-interest as an investor and oil and gas companies would be best served by the SPR depleting. So it's bullish for oil, but bearish for stability and for sort of a safe and peaceful and prosperous world. All right. Well, we've beaten up supply pretty good. Let's talk about the other side. Let's talk about demand. And I want to start with China just because that, again, like we talked about earlier, this seems to be the one story that oil investors care about, and that is a uh, lack of demand coming out of China. Um, uh, uh, I have an acquaintance who, who watches this podcast who sent me a note recently saying that his view, and he's an energy analyst, and he said you know, that his view is that China is a big influence, and the reason why it's such a big influence is that while the economy is still technically growing, 
they're not building anymore or not nearly as much as they used to. And that construction is incredibly diesel intensive. And that when that demand for diesel dropped, it really dropped oil demand uh, across the entire economy of China. What do you say to that? There are various narratives when um, prices are moving or you observe sort of large changes in volumes of things. If a, a demand falls five or ten percent or rises five or ten percent or what have you, you'll you'll hear people cite specifics, but there's also sort of a higher level uh, trajectory. And so I think it's it's good to understand the specifics just in case they could escalate um, or be become sort of much bigger factors. But it's also, I think, important to not sort of lose the forest for the trees. So the biggest single factor um, in the change in oil consumption in China this year versus last year is actually apparently not construction activity because that was already off the rails last year. You already, the China's years into this uh, real estate collapse, frankly, it's been going on as a sort of controlled decline since 2016 or 2012, depending on sort of where you start counting and how you think about this. And prices have been collapsing in the last couple of years. You had Evergrande go bankrupt. And before that, there were scares about it going bankrupt. So there's been lots of issues. So um, I think the the, the biggest single change is just that they've shifted some trucks over to using liquefied natural gas rather than diesel. That's been sort of the biggest measurable change um, in terms of the, a single and, and not really construction activity where where you were already at really low levels and maybe you're a little lower now, maybe not. There's there's some factory construction and certain other things going on right now that maybe you're offsetting some of that lower level of uh, apartment con uh, construction you know, where it was already low, let's say last year, and now it's even lower. But you know you're building some shipyards and some factories and some other things that sort of would offset that. So. Um, the China narrative is fascinating um, because I think people think that, so, so just stepping back, it's a mercantilist system, right? It's also technically communist, they, they call themselves communists, but it's a mercantilist trade system that's most similar to what happened in Japan. And the sort of boom and bust of China looks most similar, I think, and it's most analogous to Japan in the late 80s to early 90s. And one of the most interesting things for that is you had the Nikkei absolutely implode from, I think the peak was in 1987, 1988, it imploded by 1995. And they were just so bad. And the Japanese economy really struggled. And yet Japanese oil consumption grew, I believe, I don't remember if it was on a uh, overall basis or per capita basis, but it grew about 35% from, I think it was 1987, sort of near the peak for Nikkei, to 1995. And then it started to decline. But um, you, know, you saw uh, continued growth in oil consumption uh, in that period. And the reason is that you had sort of wealth destruction, but also diffusion. And so as you had more people driving cars, even though there was economic slowdown, um, as you got, let's say, another million cars on the road across the whole country of Japan, yeah, maybe you didn't have more people driving in Tokyo, but you had them driving in sort of the second tier and third tier cities or villages or whatever. So even if you were selling a few fewer cars, you still had more people driving them, buying them in various other places. And so maybe that your apartment in Tokyo wasn't worth $10 million, it was worth eight, but the farmer buying a pickup truck and using that instead of a little motorcycle or buying a motorcycle instead of using a horse-drawn carriage, whatever type of you know, thing to get their stuff to market, um, drives significant incremental oil consumption. So Back to modern China, we're seeing that right now still. And so that's what sustained oil consumption despite all these economic issues and despite the inevitable failure of this mercantilist system to generate incremental uh, GDP growth. So you're having real economic growth issues, but you're also seeing wealth diffusion and that translates best into energy consumption. And the um, there's various folks that measure this, but, um, you know, the American, uh, the average American consumes about 13 barrels of oil a year. And the average person in China, I think they're at about three or four barrels of oil per person per year. And so 
even if you don't think the Chinese consumer catches up with the U.S. consumer or the average Chinese person catches up for oil consumption, there's a long way to go. And so you could have things be really miserable for a while, but still see that tick up from three to five or five to seven over a multi-year period and across 1.2, 1.3. And again, it's sort of funny because you don't even really know the numbers because China is such a mess from a statistics perspective. But using just the very high level, let's say it's 1.2 million. And let's even say they have demographic issues and their product, their population declines a little. You still have room for substantial increases in oil consumption, even with very middling or worse economic activity. So I think China is going to keep growing their oil consumption, even with all the shifts they've done, even with more electric vehicles, even with the shift for trucks over to uh, liquefied natural gas. And so I think when you think about that, the, the sort of per capita consumption and sort of how much room there is for that to grow, every one of these things chips away at that, but you still have such a wide gap. And that's China. And then, you know, it sounded like you wanted to get to the rest of the world where there's there's room for that as well um, in India and various other places. But China just on its own, I wouldn't give up on oil demand growth from China, even if they never recover from their real estate issue, even if their mercantilist system predictably continues to fail. And then the communist aspects of it continue to fail even more. You still have this room for oil consumption per capita to grow, to get closer maybe to European levels rather than U.S. levels, but still way higher than current per capita levels. Well, speaking of per capita levels, I mean, the, the, you mentioned India. It's like the country that nobody ever talks about when when they're talking about oil demand. But India's GDP is growing at 7% or so per year. Uh, it is now the most populous nation in the world. I would have to think that that's a massive tailwind for, for petroleum products. Even if they move more into electric vehicles, from the get-go, instead of transitioning, um, like China did, for example, from from gas to electric, I I have to think that, regardless of what happens with EVs, that India is going to be a, a huge, huge consumer of oil for the next multiple decades. The EV thing is just so weird because um, there's just not steady electric power availability in most places in the world, including, unfortunately, here in Houston. <laughs> you know, we had a power outage for a week earlier this year from a hurricane. Um, California, uh, there was a Wall Street Journal article about how Los Angeles just had an outage for about 24 hours with many thousands or tens of thousands of people affected. Um, so, you know, that's bad. And you really feel it here because you really expect sort of steady energy supplies and steady availability. But as you go towards countries that have notoriously worse energy availability, um, that becomes a bigger issue and I think a less likely threat. So I think China has very effectively electrified. I don't think India is quite there. And when you look at sort of down the development spectrum, there's more room for those people to sort of start to catch up, even India catching up with China on a per capita oil consumption basis gets you another barrel or two per day, or sorry, per, per year per person. But you know, when you got one point, what is it 1.4 or something billion people in India it might be more, um, you know, that that's a lot of oil. Uh, if you add one barrel per person per year. And then when you look at Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and various other countries, Pakistan, and that immediate vicinity, you know, you're talking about even less oil per capita. And so again, you could you could be thinking that you're really effective with the energy transition and still bump that oil consumption per capita way up. And then the odds in those very poorest places of effectively executing that versus getting you know, gasoline powered or diesel powered uh, scooters and, you know, smaller cars, they're way cheaper. And the the risk there, they're the, sort of their own batteries. They're not, you don't really need to have that steady electric supply to be able to, um, to have those. So again, I think there's sort of this story of, you know, we're moving away from oil and oil demand is peaking. I mean, you see, if you just Google oil demand peaking or oil peaking, peak oil, whatever, you see tons of stuff on it. It's not oil supply peaking, it's oil demand. There's just the narrative is overwhelming, but then 
you look at the numbers and you just keep seeing oil demand growing. And even this year, you know, the narrative is, oh, like, you know, China's peaking. China looks like it's still probably going to grow about 500,000 barrels a day in demand this year in a year with their real estate collapsing and a year with all kinds of other issues. And then just one specific point on the data for China. So um, Chinese imports collapsed in July of of oil. Uh, They were down, it looked like over a million barrels a day. And then they were up over a million barrels a day from that July level in August. And they're still lower than they were last year for that August number, but they're even higher so far in September. And we'll see, again, this is you know data from satellite data providers and various other folks, um, but it does look like it's sort of recovering. And so there was this weak moment and there is typically weakness in that sort of July month. It looks like in path, in, sorry, in past, um, past years from various holidays and sort of other issues, there's, there's typically weakness. There was more weakness this year, but there's also more recovery. And it's going to be really interesting if that continues to see this narrative shift of, oh, China's oil demand is dead to, oh, surprise, China's back to growing a million barrels a day oil demand year over year. And maybe it won't, maybe it'll be 500,000, but there's no evidence that Chinese consumption has collapsed. And there's this sort of very like cherry picked, very sort of time specific aspect to China's oil consumption having been a little lower. And I think we're still sort of in that, um, in the aftermath of that big drop in July. And so as we see oil prices falling right now, um, I think it's sort of exciting, weirdly, because the more people short oil based on bad July numbers and then a big recovery, but not a good year over year number for August. Um, well, if you just get a little more recovery for September, and again, the data looks pretty good for that so far. So it's not like the satellites are saying, oh, the, the data has collapsed. It looks like this recovery is continuing. And again, it's logical that it would continue because a lot of this demand is not, uh, we're going to go build a thousand skyscrapers. It's a farmer in a rural province gets a pickup truck or, you know, upgrades from a bicycle to a gas powered scooter. And and that's still happening at scale. And so as as that continues, you're going to see this recovery and it seems pretty likely it's this year and pretty likely it's September and October data being good. And so we'll see. I think by the end of this year, we might have the opposite narrative of instead of, oh, China's demand is dead. Hey, <laughs> China's demand actually grew a little. And it's still not amazing year over year, but it, it it grew a lot more than people thought and resetting to demand growth at scale next year and sort of just a real shift. And I think you'll notice if you look back over the last few years, there's these sort of peaks and troughs in terms of sentiment towards China and and towards uh, oil demand sentiment. And I think we're at a very, very low moment in that sentiment. But I think it's important to, when you're in those sorts of moments, look closely and say, hey, is this real, right? Did it collapse and not recover? Or did it collapse and recover? And here's why it fell. And here's why it's recovering. And here's why it's likely to do this next thing. And I think that really differentiates Um, longer term investors in terms of being able to buy things that are cheap and then buy more with if or when they get cheaper or sell them if you realize, hey, this thing is actually a problem. And I think the insight today to have would be, hey, here the data is good and here's why it's good or why it's less bad than the narrative is. And to have that sort of longer term perspective on where per capita consumption is likely to go, which means where the overall country consumption is likely to go, which means demand is probably going a lot higher and it hasn't peaked like Bloomberg and others have said over and over and over again about China over the last five years. That's a great point. On, in terms of prices, before we started, you were you were talking about the, uh, the 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 investor journey for for an investor in oil, and it's pain, 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 profit. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like you're hanging in there personally, at least. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there are things that are just unreasonably cheap, and stocks that came into this latest downturn that were already cheap or already sort of out of favor have traded off a lot more. Um, there's one, I won't say the name, but there's one where the stock is falling precipitously of it as if it's going to go bankrupt, 
but the bonds are trading above par. And if you <laughs> look at the bonds, the bonds say things are good, interest rates up 10%, you know, which is amazing for these sort of shale producers. Like they're historically, their cost of capital was very high. And so, you know, they, they would get really cheap bank debt and then really expensive bond debt and then get bailed out every, uh, every downturn. That was sort of the, the name of the, of the shale game. And so, um, you know, there's just a number of these things where you can just tell what the thing is worth using a proxy like bonds in that company or recent transactions or figure out the free cash flow at various prices. Or, you know, in some of these cases, there are these oil producers that also produce natural gas and natural gas liquids. And even if oil falls, natural gas has actually been rising very recently and the forward curve looks pretty good. And so maybe you have a world, and again, this isn't my expectation, but maybe I'm wrong and oil prices stay low for longer than I think, but you have higher natural gas prices because you have less drilling for oil, which helps support natural gas. And so one of these companies producing a third oil, a third NGLs, and a third gas might actually make more money or a similar amount of money at, let's say, $65 oil, but $4 gas versus 75 or $80 oil and $2 natural gas and then negative gas prices at their actual wells because Waha or ACO, one of these other bases actually, I mean, a couple of them were negative recently and one of them was negative substantially. So um, you know, people talk about negative oil prices being this wonderful place to go get exposure to oil and gas stocks. And they miss that West Texas natural gas prices were negative for most of this year, not most of this year, uh, for portions of this year. And for there were moments where you actually had to pay, I think the highest uh, discount was negative uh, $7 per MCF for gas. So so I think it's very exciting and interesting. And there's these big mispricings. And that's what I live for. Like, I love finding this stuff. And when everyone else hates it and says, oh, you're stupid, or that thing's wrong, or it's going to zero, you know, if you can do the analysis and figure it out, that's where the very best buying opportunities are. So, you know, it's stressful and annoying, but also wonderful <laughs> buying opportunities. If it was easy, everyone would do it. What do you see coming in terms of mergers and acquisitions. Do you feel like we might be heading into a period where uh, the, the U.S. oil patch and frackers are, are, are in a wave of consolidation uh, or, or majors acquiring them? We're already well into that. I mean, we've had this, uh, the Exxon acquisition of Pioneer is enormous. We have the Conoco Marathon deal going on right now. It's supposed to close soon, I think. Um, you have uh, Chevron trying to buy Hess, which I guess is more about Guyana, but you know, also would be a, a large amount of production from a shale field. Um, so yeah, I think, I think you're already seeing that. And then my forecast had been that we would get to a point where the available private oil companies uh, for purchase were going to get essentially depleted, and you would start to see these big premium public company buyouts. So you saw a small premium for Marathon, but there were two different companies in Canada that were just bought for 50 to 70% premiums versus where their stocks were trading. That's right. One of them, a shale producer, one sort of a mixed oil and gas and NGL producer. And it's pretty, pretty remarkable to see those. And I think we're going to see I think as this consolidation trend continues, you're going to run out of these privates to go buy either with cash or stock or what have you. And I think you're going to see more public company buyouts. And I think you're going to see buyout premiums, especially given where these stocks have traded recently. I think you're going to see buyout premiums that are enormous versus where current share prices are, are hovering. What sort of sector or level of, of oil and gas company are you most attracted to right now? Is it the, is it the majors? Do you prefer explorers, frackers? What, what area do you like best? There's this weird niche that actually a number of companies fit in. So it's not just one or two that hit this. I like oil producers that have this exposure to gas that's been heavily discounted or negative recently. And I, some of them have been able to paint themselves as oil producers and get their investors to ignore those negative prices. And they've maintained very high valuations. And some of them have gotten destroyed because people look at their financial results, can't decipher that the poor financial results 
recently have been from these negative natural gas prices. Uh, and again, they like show up sometimes as zero or slightly positive because of hedging or uh, various other factors, but they still, they look really bad in the financials to, if a third of your production, you, you got, let's say, six dollars in mcf for it two years ago and now you're getting zero for it and really you're getting <laughs> negative but you're able to sort of do some accounting stuff that would show up as zero that looks really bad it looks like your field is way worse because it's making way less money but the reality is that the natural gas price fell and you're a producer where you were trading more for oil than for gas and people maybe didn't even appreciate the exposure you had to gas or ngls as well so that sort of and it's true, I think, not just in one particular area. There's companies that I think have gotten hit because of this across multiple different basins and actually multiple different countries. And so I like that because it's not a question of, oh, is this field underperforming? Oh, is this, you know, are there more locations to drill here? Is it bad management? Is it badly, you know, are the, the engineering operations problematic? N none of those questions are really that relevant. Once you see sort of what's happening to the financials, some of these companies, it's amazing. Their results are so good that they're even grown a little, even with um, these terrible natural gas prices. So, so that's one category. And then the one other area that I'm finding really compelling are some of the oil field services companies that are equipment intensive, where they've traded at a very large discount to their replacement cost, but where they're still earning a profit. And so if you can go buy something for 30 cents or 20 cents on the dollar versus its replacement cost, but also earn, let's say, two cents or three cents or four cents a year while you hold it, or in some cases, even more than that, it's pretty amazing. Normally, you can either buy things at a large discount to replacement cost and their cash flow negative, or pay a premium to replacement cost and then get a bunch of earnings. And so it's pretty rare to get sort of that combination of big discount to replacement cost, which is sort of that deep value approach, but also get like a pretty good free cash flow yield, pretty good profitability. And so that sort of, it shouldn't exist. And it exists right now among certain smaller oil field services companies. And I don't know if it's that people don't want to underwrite to those replacement costs, if people have issues with maybe they think that you're going to need fewer drilling rigs or fewer other things. Um, but the one, the one caveat to that or the sort of thing that makes it more comfortable is that there is um, sort of forced depreciation where you can use pressure pumping equipment for a few years and then it's it it gets sort of chewed up and and is you know either requires a lot of maintenance capital investment or um, needs to be replaced and then drilling rigs also over time there's a lot of that that replacement cost is realized in terms of maintenance capex or replacement of those rigs and so um you can i think safely underwrite to those replacement costs and you want to be careful with it and adjust and be cognizant of where these things sell for in the private markets and when they get liquidated um but i think that area is again with a lot of caveats and being very careful in analysis it's just such a wonderful getting the deep value and cash flow is just you know <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty pretty rare, and and I, I I really like that. I've done this trade twice before in my career, and both times before it was extraordinarily successful. So I I have the, the history in it, and um you know I just I can't believe these things make as much money as they do and trade at the large discounts that they do. That's the thing that uh, investors always have to remind themselves, right? You've, you you've got to buy when there's blood in the streets. That's when the best opportunity comes. Absolutely, so, Josh. I really like how you look at the uh, the oil space. Always enjoy speaking with you. Josh Young, Bison Interests, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Before you go, be sure to subscribe to our channel, leave a comment, and be sure to check out the links in the description where you can sign up for my free newsletter and you can learn more about Josh Young's company, Bison Interests. Thanks for watching.